I'm excited to be here. Hi. Um, so yeah, my name is Liz. You can find me online at Learning Nerd. Um, if you want to uh, post anything on Twitter, give you the thumbs up. That's totally fine. If you want to post pictures or anything. And yeah, I like uh, you mentioned in my intro. I work at Sentry as a developer avocado slash advocate. And uh, there I am, right over there. I started a, a few months ago, and as I spoke about in my talk on on day one. I've had a lot of chances to learn uh, a lot about JavaScript and other things, specifically error reporting. That's what Sentry does. Actually, how many of you use Sentry? I'm just kind of curious. Oh, cool, cool. OK, so like, yeah, you already know what it is. So yeah, we're an open source tool that makes um, a platform for aggregating and understanding errors across. We have an SDK for just about everything. So that's my plug. But a bit about me, um, aside from being a develop developer advocate, I'm also an aspiring uh, musician. I always wanted to play piano, and when I was a kid, I started and took lessons for like two weeks and gave up, and then uh, never really learned how to read music, though. I would just learn songs like very, very slowly, one note at a time, mostly by listening to them and then watching YouTube videos of other people play them. But the missing piece was the notation. And this was my workaround, is I would just pencil in the letters for each note one by one and then read the letters to then find where they are on the keyboard. So a two-step process instead of a one-step process. And I really wanted to learn how to sight read. And for me, it feels a lot like in programming, I imagine, very similar if you were to, say, build an application without knowing how to touch type. It's totally doable. But the developer experience is a lot nicer if you can touch type, right? So whoops, there we go. Um, so this is basically how. I do music. <laughs> um, I'm a, like a hunt and peck musician, basically. So I, I wanted to get better at this, and I thought maybe a game would make this a bit more interesting for me. So the way that I actually learned how to touch type was this lovely game, Mario Teaches Typing. I don't know if anyone knows this. Maybe this is dating me a little bit. It came out in 1992. <laughs> and all the kids at my school were completely obsessed with this game because it you can see it looks like a game, even though it's really just a typing test dressed up as a game. Uh, but it tricked us into thinking we were having fun. So all the kids got really excited when we got to play this at school. And I thought, well, if I add a little nostalgia and maybe this sort of a mechanic and something to make it a little bit more fun, I can build an app to help me learn how to read music. Um, little tangent, just for fun, I found this on the internet on a random Wikipedia binge that apparently, <laughs> this is like in the 1800s or uh, early, maybe, 1900. Um, this is a, an early printing telegraph. So they actually would send messages uh, by basically playing on a piano to type uh, sentences, which I thought was an interesting. So the, the concept of matching up typing and piano is not at all new. So I take no credit for the idea. Um, and speaking of technologies, um, the newest one for me that I also wanted to learn combined with this project is Elm. Does anyone, has anyone here heard of Elm? Oh, OK, not that many people. So Elm is a functional language that compiles into JavaScript. And for me, being someone who's always wanted to learn functional programming and tried Haskell and a few others and gave up just like piano after a couple of weeks, uh, Elm was the missing piece for me. It was a much friendlier, simpler language that just was a, a very happy experience. I put Bob Ross here because for me, if Elm was a programming language, it would it, uh, if Elm, the language, were a person, it would be Bob Ross, because it's literally named after a happy little tree, and it is a very happy language, um, just a pleasure to work with. Um, it's actually used by McMaster University to teach 10-year-old kids how to code as their very first language. I, I, I can't imagine seeing a headline like that for, like, university teaches 10-year-olds their first language with Haskell. Like, it just wouldn't happen, right? So um, I figured if 10-year-olds can learn a functional language as their very first one, like, yeah, I, I can probably figure it out, too. So I started learning Elm while I was at the Recurse Center, which, if you're not familiar, look it up. It's an amazing group of people. Um, and posted on Twitter about some of the stuff that we learned. And then Evan uh, Sopliki himself actually replied, uh, which was super exciting. He's the creator of Elm and very, very friendly. And that's one of the benefits of working in a newer language like this is, I mean, you know, there's a trade-off. Um, you don't have as, as uh, big an ecosystem of libraries to work with, but since it's a small community, everybody's very, very friendly and kind of everyone knows each other. And you can talk to the creative language regularly on Twitter and like ask them to fix your bugs. So 
Um, so next technology that I learned along with this was the musical instrument digital interface, also known as MIDI. And this is going to be the smallest part of my, my talk because I only used a very, very small piece of it, this technology. But as a recap, MIDI um, was, was formed in the 1980s as a standard for synthesizers like this and other music, musical related hardware to communicate with each other because before that there was no standard. So if you want one brand of a synthesizer to talk to another one, there was no easy way to do it. Um, fast forward to today, now we have um, the web MIDI uh, API built into Chrome, and we can actually use that to connect a device like this one with a USB cable and just connect it right into your laptop, open up a browser, and start playing music. Um, the way that it works, is like super simplified short version of how it works, is you just assign a number to each key, each button, all these knobs to everything is assigned a number. Um, and then you just get a, a string of numbers, an array of numbers into your application. Um, and it's not only used for music, so this is an example of what's supposed to be used for music, but he's actually just using it to play Tetris, um, using MIDI, of course, behind the scenes. And apparently some wheelchairs actually can output MIDI too, so it's used to control all, all sorts of different devices. Now, it's not super well supported on the web yet, pretty much just in Chrome, so FYI, um, but it's good enough for a prototype. What you get in JavaScript is this MIDI.data array with three numbers. The only one that I care about in this application is the middle one, so 60 represents the key middle C and I just kind of ignored the others, but they're useful for other things. And what this looks like in JavaScript, um, sending this into Elm, because Elm doesn't have first-class support just yet for the MIDI API, since it is a newer language, but it has pretty good interop with JavaScript. So I'm getting that uh, second integer from the data here, and then passing that into uh, Elm this way using this ports feature. Um, and then I can like handle each note when I'm pressing uh, on this keyboard, like that. So I'm just getting a bunch of integers into my Elm code, and then I don't need to worry about JavaScript anymore after that. So this is <laughs> very exciting <laughs> first prototype um, for me, where all it's not a game yet or really anything to teach me. Uh, it just shows the note that I'm pressing at that moment, and then using the Elm debugger, I can see the list of events um, streaming into my application. And then on, on the other side, you can see the model of my app updating in real time. So this was just, Elm is just so friendly. It was super nice. So this is a weird matchup of JavaScript and Elm code. Uh, the syntax is a bit different. In Elm, you don't use semicolons, though, and that was my mistake coming from JavaScript. I just had semicolons all over the place. So very common beginner mistake. Uh, another one. <laughs> is not putting parentheses in the right places and forgetting like, the order of operations when you're calling a function. Um, we don't use parens around uh, arguments when you're calling a function in Elm, so we just use spaces instead, um, no commas either. So like, this code should output 10 in theory, but it actually just gave me one every time, and I was like, why is this, what? Like, did I forget how arithmetic works? And no, I just need to put parentheses around that part. So like, a lot of these little syntax errors were the main things, actually, that tripped me up. Other than that, Elm was super easy to get started with, and it was just retraining my brain a little bit from getting out of JavaScript mode um, when I'm you know, actually physically typing things out. Uh, very similar to the muscle memory that I had to learn to play piano. So. <laughs> Uh, in summary, <laughs> this is my like, super beginner level lesson learned is in Elm, if you just parentheses all of the things, generally your code will work. <laughs> That's the main mistake that I made. Uh, there's also this lovely operator, sometimes called the uh, pizza, or the for forward function application operator, um, which lets you not write as many parentheses, and it turned out to be really, really nice once you get used to it. So here's the model for my application initially. In Elm, we have this concept of a maybe, and another beginner mistake is to put maybe literally everywhere in your application and just think that, uh, okay, well, I could have a Boolean here, but it also could be undefined. I could have a note being played, but that could also be undefined. So I guess everything is a maybe, because in JavaScript, everything could possibly be undefined. And no, that just makes your life a lot harder. <laughs> so I learned from some other folks uh, big in the Elm community who've given some really good talks, like, for example, this one by Richard Feldman, who's Oh, he's giving that Elm workshop right now in the other building. 
<laughs> um, that there's much better ways to work with your model. So kind of just copy pasted their code and changed it a little bit to work in my situation. And now my model looks more like this, where I have this game, uh, this abstracted version where I could be a different states in the application. And then if you're in the state where you have the game running, then you have this game model is like this sub model. And given that, I was able to take out all those maybes and just have like one maybe and everything else I know by the time I get to playing the game, all of these other parts of my model are definitely defined. It is literally impossible uh, to have undefined in most places. That was super, super nice. I initially started using um, this Elm, Elm style animation library. Um, that was great at, at first. It's really great for UI animations. So you can see that it helped me make this feel just a little bit more uh, organic and having like a note fade in and fade out. So the idea for this first version of the game is if you play the wrong note, it'll show up in red and sh show you, okay, I didn't play that one, I didn't play G, but I played this instead. So once I play the correct note, it'll fade into green and then give me another one. So like super simple animation, but very satisfying. And the way that I wrote that code using this library is this nice declarative syntax where I can say like, okay, this many milliseconds to fade in, um, I want to go to from opacity 100% down to zero. Very, very nice. Now, the next part was, this doesn't really look enough like a game, so what if I add sprites to it? I wanted this to look a little bit like Mario teaches typing, so I literally went to the internet and downloaded these giant sprite sheets. If you zoom in, you can see these are all the different variations of Mario that you can have from Super Mario, uh, which was one of my favorite games when I was a kid. Now, I used SVGs to handle this animation, and it turned out to be very nice. This is what the code looks like in Elm. Um, and you can actually just do the exact same thing if you're familiar with CSS sprites. Um, same idea, you have like an image, and you just show a section of it at a time so I can define like the size of the actual sprite, and then just kind of shift that along one after the other. And if you animate that, you have something like this with Mario's coin. Um, so that was satisfying. First baby steps. And then <laughs> combine that with some more sprites and I have like, again, it's not really a game, but it kind of looks like one. Um, and this was great at first, but you'll notice it's a little bit buggy. Sometimes Mario lands on the coin, but nothing happens. So even if I played the right note, it wouldn't advance the game. Um, and other times Mario um, would scroll sometimes and then the game would scroll sometimes and I don't, I never figured out why I wasn't consistent. And at this point, I realized that most of my code didn't make any sense to me. I didn't understand the library. I really didn't understand even what I was trying to accomplish in this game. And as I'm sure you've all experienced at some point, the hardest part is not so much writing the code, but like, what is my goal in the first place? And just deciding like, how do I want people to interact with this? Um, so I went back to the drawing board, literally, and I made a lot of really bad drawings like this one to figure out what do I want it to do, how is this supposed to work, and I decided to do this without any animation libraries and just figure out how to do this from scratch. So in JavaScript, you use the um, request animation frame method on the window object to you know, be able to paint things to the browser um, every however many milliseconds, roughly 60 frames per second if uh, your animation's like not too crazy. And so this is how you do it in Elm using this uh, on animation frame event. So I have an animation loop. I can get the timestamp, but I didn't know what, what okay, now what, what do I put in there? How do you animate things? I've never done that before. <laughs> so I went on the internet again and looked up, you know, animation terms, animation basics, and I found a bunch of very odd words like lerping and tweening and easing and people using them all different ways and not totally understanding what the difference is between them. And I won't get into de the details because I don't have time, but found some interesting things like this Unity tutorial about how to do a lerp. And I looked up lerp and it turns out a lerp is a sweet waxy secretion found in <laughs> on, uh, eucalyptus trees from this interesting uh, bug. So th there you go. <laughs> and I looked it up on Wikipedia. It stands for linear interpolation. Okay, no, it doesn't actually say it. I changed it. Uh, interpolation. So that's what it stands for. And there's a bunch of other interesting variations of it, like slurps. I don't know what a quaternion slurp is, but that's a thing in game development, apparently. And this goes really deep, it turns out. People get very creative with what to call all these different ways you can, you can animate. 
Um, what I found more helpful was actually going back to this um, very famous and older um, book written by Robert Penner, who coined um, some terms like the standard exponential slide. This is back in the days of flash animation and, and action script. So <laughs> I don't know if anyone who here did like flash animation. Anyone remember that? Yeah. So like, oh, that was fun. I played with that a tiny bit. Um, so the standard exponential slide is a very simple idea for animating things in a way that feels lifelike, but very, very, very little code required to do it. Um, basically just borrowing from Zeno's paradox, the idea that if you're moving from A to B, like every time you take a step closer, um, you still have like this much more space to go. And since, you know, space can be divided infinitely, you'll never actually get to your destination. Same idea, just doing this um, like in JavaScript, for example, say I move 50% of the way to the target and then another 50% of the remaining and so on and so on and so forth. And, you know, Technically, in JavaScript, uh, you will get to the destination, but that's only because of rounding errors. But it, it works out quite nicely. Um, and the code for this just looks like that. Just this nice one-liner where I'm just updating the position and then, um, you know, it's, it's like a recursive function. So I played around with different variations of this um, for the scrolling motion to make that feel fluid. And then I played around with that um, to make Mario scroll in that fluid way, too, and that was nice. But at some point I realized, oh wait, this is copyright infringement too, isn't it? Maybe I shouldn't be using the Mario sprites. Um, and I, you know, it's more creative to come up with something of your own. It's just more fun that way. So I started sketching ideas here of what else, what would be the theme of this game? What other kind of graphics could I do? I'm not very good at drawing, but you can see some of the early ideas here was like, well, maybe it's like a cat that like jumps into different containers. Because I, I don't know if you have ever been on the cat part of the internet, but cats really like containers, I learned. So I thought, well, okay, I should do some re research on this, because really I didn't know what to do with my game, so I spent, I don't want to admit how many hours, researching cats, and like what that might, you know, how would I draw this if they, if this was my game. Um, <laughs> I had to decide what kind of container I would use. At some point, <laughs> I gave up on that. <laughs> This whole talk was just an excuse to show you my favorite cat memes. Um, anyway, I decided to put that on hold and then go back to the real problem, which was, all right, regardless of the graphics, the reason it felt off was because in Super Mario and in most games, you have some kind of like jumping mechanism, something more than just like instantly teleporting up and down and then just like scrolling. And it just it didn't feel interesting enough. Um, in game dev, there's this term called juiciness. It wasn't like juicy enough. So I wanted to learn, okay, how do I make it jump? So I played around with that exponential slide technique, um, right? So I can get it to go in a straight line. Let's say I want to jump, jump from A to B, but as you can see, this is definitely not a jump. At least it's not like linear, linear motion, so it doesn't feel robotic, but it's definitely not jumping. Then I played around with doing the X and Y values uh, at different rates. So you do get a curve, but still doesn't quite feel like jumping, does it? Because when you jump, you don't just go like up and then slam sideways into the target. So you have to go up and over and then land down, right? Because, well, gravity, right? I kind of forgot about that part. So I never took physics in school, which is something I really want to do later. But this is all a completely foreign concept to me. <laughs> it's like, well, how do you do gravity in, uh, in your code? I don't, I don't know. So, Turns out, it's actually really easy. This is, I'll show you the entire animation code of my application at this point. Um, I have this concept of velocity, and I'm adding it, adding it to um, my uh, x and y position. And then I also add this, uh, this um, acceleration value for the, uh, the y-axis, so that on every frame, the velocity is slowly increasing, or in this case, slowly decreasing. Um, so if I add gravity, ta-da, kind of looks like a jump, right? <laughs> I just kind of, all I have to do now is change the numbers, right? What should the velocity be? What should acceleration be? So change that around a little bit. We're like getting closer. This took a while. But I'm like so close. Ah, that was like a shirt. Okay, this isn't gonna work, right? Because A and B can be in very different places and I have like no way to predict what they're gonna be because it's dynamic, right? That's the whole point of this being computer program. <laughs> so back to the drawing board again. I asked my housemate, Daniel, one Saturday morning, hey Daniel, can you teach me physics? 
And he said, like, yeah, sure. No, I got a couple hours. So we looked some stuff on the internet, uh, looked up this equation for a very simplified model of um, projectile motion, and played around with the variables. I'll skip over part of this in the interest of time, but um, long and short of it is I can plug in uh, the velocity, the acceleration, and then find out like if I have my starting point, then where will I end up given these values? And like we got that part working. But the tricky thing was, well, I already know um, where I want to be and how long it should take. So I just had to do it backwards. Like, given some acceleration and the amount of time I want this object to be moving, uh, what should the initial velocity be for it to get from this place to this place, given all of those parameters that I want? So algebra, I'm going to have to switch things around. Bingo. Um, so <laughs> drumroll, please. Do you think it works? <laughs> Yay! <laughs> this is like, the single most exciting moment I've had since I've been programming games. <laughs> I gave this talk at Elm Europe um, earlier this year and like literally flew 12 hours to another country to talk for like 20 minutes to show how I got a square to move from one side of the screen to another. But you know, those small wins are what keep you going when you're learning something new or, or several new things and the entire time wondering if this is all a waste of time and you'll ever figure out what you're trying to do. So once I got it working in one case, it already worked in any other case. So it is dynamic. You can jump from any place to any other place. And I got that combined with the scrolling code. And then we have this lovely little, yeah, it's starting to feel lifelike. And then back to the graphics, instead of cats, because I didn't have time to like, draw this stuff, turns out it's very slow drawing your own pixel art, uh, I found this little guy. There's a lot of cool, free, copyright free um, game graphics on there. So here he is, kind of like this, and a little cloud, marshmallow looking guy. So I thought, okay, let's see, maybe he's a cloud, and you're like jumping from one cloud to the other, kind of like in, floating in space or something. I don't know. So I started drawing clouds. Uh, that was like, one of my weekends, <laughs> thought, like, okay, maybe the clouds are like sad and then they become happy when you like land on them or something, I don't know. Um, turns out debugging pixels is a lot harder than debugging code, a lot harder. <laughs> um, so you're lining things up in Photoshop and anyway, long story short, uh, that was version one of my application, which I can show you now real quick. Um, so let's see, here I am in my browser and if you run the app, It'll check if you're connected to a MIDI device, like this one. So I can click Start Playing. It should be connected. And so it's just, this is like level zero. There's only three notes to choose from. It randomly generates a long list of them, and then I just have to go through and play the correct one. Well, let's see if this is right. Yay! <laughs> There's a little bug you'll notice if you play too fast, he'll jump infinitely high and eventually come back down, but... <laughs> but you know, we got our thank you. <laughs> Thanks. There's a little bit more that I can do now, but I'll leave off there. That'll be for version two. Now it is, um, let me jump ahead to this slide and then I'll have time for a couple questions, I think. Uh, here it is. Okay, so it is on GitHub, uh, still buggy, um, but it's on there if you want to take a look at the code or fork it. I'm open to pull requests, any suggestions. Um, and then, yeah, if you want to find me online, I would love ideas for what to do with this next. Thanks. Oh, yeah. <laughs>